God, I feel like it's close, but not quite there. So we need to stage an intervention. I mean, it's not even just for his sake, because that guy hasn't broken 75 in I don't know how long. Some people are enablers. I think, you know what, as well, though, genuinely, I feel like those shots at normal course, you'd be more than getting away with it. If that was at, like, the Marriott, you'd be absolutely fine. I want Rick Shields to be as good as he can be, and if I can somehow introduce him to you, because I watch these videos on Golf Smart Academy. Folks, as promised, I've got Tyler Farrell on the show right now. He's going to talk us through Golf Smart Academy and give us a lot of insight into how potentially we can all make our golf swings better. Tyler, thanks for being on Big Boy Pants Golf. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to dig into this stuff. First off, I'm going to throw this name out there, Charles Howell III. Yes. Charles Howell, kind of long story short, I was kind of one of the early adopters with golf 3D motion analysis, especially AMM. And my first boss was Dr. Greg Rose, who ran the Titleist Performance Institute. So early on in my career, I, I had access to looking at all this data, how the best players were like measurably, how they were swinging the club. And so early on in my career, I was posting on a lot of golf discussion groups about the wrist graphs, because at that time in 3D, everybody was talking about how the body was working, but not a lot of people were talking about the wrist. And at the time, Charles Howell's coach was Grant Waite, and he would partake in some of these discussion groups. And he noticed me talking about the wrist a lot. And it was one of those, just, I got a message out of the blue, like, Hey, I have a player with some funky wrist stuff. Would you be willing to take a look? And obviously, you know, Charles has that really big kind of down cocking move and what's going on in his wrist. And we talked for maybe an hour or so on Skype back then. And then two days later, I was on a plane to Orlando to work with them for a few days. Uh, it just kind of just snowballed. And he, he liked the way that I could relate everything together. He was very happy with Grant Waite, who um, they were working on in their swing. My role was to come in and make sure that his exercise program complemented what they were working on um, in the swing. And so I ran his fitness program for about four or five years. And I, I would get to go out with him to a handful of tournaments a year and kind of get a little taste of that behind the ropes life. And Charles is just a, he would be one of us if he wasn't a professional golfer. Like he loves studying the, the golf swing and understanding what's going on. He just happens to be you know, a, a freak of an athlete and he's able to do it at a really high level. You know, he was one of my favorite clients to ever, ever work with because he had really good questions, really wanted to understand it. And one phrase he, he used a, a few times is, all right, I don't quite get it, but I'm going to try to prove you wrong until I prove you right. Cause it keeps working. That's an awesome story. That had to be kind of mind blowing event to be flying out, to hang out and, and coach and train Charles Howell III. Yes, he was really my first um, exposure into the kind of tour life. And it, it, it was very surreal. You know, here I was just kind of posting online, not realizing that people around the world were, were actually reading this stuff. Um, and, and yeah, uh, to, to kind of see uh, some of the early success when we started working together, like that was very um, encouraging, kind of validating uh, to hopefully, you know, that what I was studying was not just kind of theory, but it actually worked. It works so well, he won on Live Golf Tour this year. Charles Howell III he was simply masterful today. Yeah, I can't really take credit for that one. We haven't, I, we, we still talk and, and text a little bit, but at this point, he's, he's got more of a balanced life. He's more into his family life. And so he, he'll ask me questions here and there, but I'd say he kind of manages his own fitness program at this point. He kind of cycles through a lot of the old programs and, and throws in some new stuff and He's, he's doing great. Well, it's also amazing how he has not only, you know, taken in all this information, he's also giving out swing tips. I see these little clips come out now where he's giving pointers where I remember the first one I saw, you got like a, a, a lineman stick between your legs and his hips, actually his right buttocks muscle would be on the left side of that lineman stick on the top of his backswing. He's on his left side, he says. As soon as I start the club back, my goal is to take my right hip and put it right here at the midline. So as I'm turning back, the hip goes, it's there. Now from there, I actually feel pressure under this foot, not this one. I would say 
that topic right there transitions us into what was my purpose with Golf Smart Academy, which is golf is a, a very complex uh, activity, but it's also one that it's really easy to kind of go down paths where you see people doing stuff, you don't totally understand what's happening and you just try to mimic it. And before you know it, you've like created a new problem and you don't know how to get back to where you were, right? How many people have kind of lost their game, whether it's for a week, a month, a season, I like to think that now if you have a system in place, you, you know how to read the feedback, yeah, you're still going to struggle, but hopefully you can get out of it faster and get back to where you were and maybe even better than where you were. Understanding what that drill does is the key to getting something out of that drill. I don't know if I should be trying that drill that Charles Howell III was teaching because he was doing a lot of stuff. He was putting pumping out a lot of these little clips on YouTube, but we'll focus on that in a second. Another... Very famous name, short game legend, Stan Utley. Prior to working with, with Charles, I had moved to Arizona um, to work with a group that was potentially buying one of these 3D systems and trying to put it into a golf club. And when I moved to Arizona, Stan Utley was at the club that we were kind of doing some of the testing at. And he was very curious, as most of those, those guys are. Um, and he had known, he had worked with Greg Rose, so he knew my connection that way. Um, so... I put him on 3D, did a fitness assessment on him, gave him, gave him an exercise program, a little diet recommendation, stuff like that. Because that was more when I was doing the fitness side of it. But we, we hung out a lot and he was great at sharing what his feels were and what his ideas were. And I like to think that I'm pretty good at being able to take what they say and figure out what they mean. So like, okay, this is what you felt. What might your body have actually been doing in order to feel that way? How can I turn that into a message that I can use to share to other people? Because his feels might not work well for you, but the concepts, like the physics of what he's doing, how he's able to be so consistent, if we can bottle that up and figure out how to get you to feel some of those similar feelings, then now we're onto something. This is awesome. Folks at home, the video Champions Tour driver analysis drove me to reach out to you. It was awesome. And, and here's what I thought was particularly awesome about it. The fact that you also included Rocco Mediate. Yeah. Be I, because I, he, he's the only guy that if you watch, I, I remember watching something on YouTube, but he has a little clip. He's the only guy that who's a proponent where it's like, get your upper body on top of the ball when you're hitting a driver. This is going to really screw you up. I don't ever want to be behind it when I hit it. Of course, we're all taught to stay behind the ball. Crap. I want to see it more on top. Any athletic motion, you're going back. And you're going up to it. See, I'm on it. Everything's right on it, which is what I want. This is the whole Jimmy Ballard, go back to Curtis Strange, win and win again book. You know, you're throwing a sack of potatoes down the fairway. I was heavily into that method because of the promise of not destroying my back. There's probably something to it as far as not destroying your back, at least your lower back. So the, the, the tricky thing is potentially what your arms have to do if you adopt that method can put a little bit more stress into your your upper body, your shoulder girdle, your neck. Um, so, you know, if you have more of like a, a really big um, postural issue related more to like kyphosis or, or rounded shoulder or something, that might not be the best method to adopt. So my whole, my whole message is to try to help you understand your swing, what the fundamentals are for each of the, the key components. So there's, there's kind of like different optimal movements that work for the driver, that work for the irons, that work for the wedges, that work for putting. Um, and so when you're working on your own game, my, my tagline is, is you are your own best golf coach. My, my goal is that you understand um, what you need to do to be successful with each of those areas. Um, there, there were two things that kind of drove me to that. One, um, I remember early on, uh, I had a golf digest subscription when I was learning golf in high school. And for a while they would have, um, tour players have their index card. I don't know if you remember this, but they would, they would basically have an index card and they would write down their like three to five keys. Like I got to swing okay. easy. Um, I got to load up on my right side. I got, you know, whatever their keys might be. I remember Jack Nicholas saying that most pros have like three to five keys that make their swing work. And over the course of a season, or on a small scale, when they're warming up, they're running through their keys to see which one is working well and which one needs a little bit more focus at that time. And usually when they go through a little bit of a slump, 
it's one or two of their keys that they're just not dialed in with and they have to do some work to kind of get it back. But the idea that every golfer ends up with kind of their little recipe of here's how I hit a driver. If I, if I get a little bit of tilt and I lead with my hips and I swing out to right field, boom, I, I hit good drivers. And so your goal of being your own coach is to figure out your, your index card, to figure out your three to five keys for each major shot. I'm good to see your Jack Nicholas knowledge and raise you one and tie it into your academy as well. Because remember, Jack Nicholas only saw Jack Route once in a while. Like maybe at yeah. the beginning of the year, you get fixed up, you get fine tuned a little bit. And I also remember this from Jack Nicholas's reading something he uh, he put out there was, yeah, you all you forget when in the off season you forget your your you maybe your good habits you get a little rusty, but you also forget your bad habits. So, you know, you get Jack Rout, you tune them up, but the rest of the year, you're on your own. It's not like nowadays where, you know, you need these guys, they, every five minutes, it's just like, you know, so they need someone there to be like, Hey, maybe I need this or that. You're like, you're on your own. You got golf smart Academy. I've been through the videos. I've been punching through them because folks, and this, I love this. This shows a man of integrity, seven day, no credit card needed. Yeah. Um, in full transparency, we're in the process of shortening that to three days, just because uh, what we've noticed in the trend is they, they either like it and then they sign up after the, the first day or two, or then they end up on the list and we just keep emailing them. So we're trying to streamline it a, a little bit, but yes, I want people to be able to, like, I recognize the site has probably a thousand videos, so you're not gonna be able to watch them all in any length of free trial I give you but I want you to have a taste of it to see if you're going to, if you're going to agree with my style, if you're going to like the way I present the information to you. And at the very least, I'm hoping that you'll walk away with some understanding of the system. Like how do I approach managing my own golf game? That's what, that's ultimately what I, what I want to try to communicate. Because if you, if you break it down, there's a lot of videos on the site. Most of them are drills. So there's kind of a two-step process. Let's say we'll, we'll come back to some specifics, but let's say you wanted to work on your driver. You have to be able to read the feedback and figure out what's going wrong with your driver, right? So I use the hierarchy of we got to hit the ball solid, we need to hit the ball straight, and we want to hit the ball far. But it's those first two really of solid and straight that are going to make golf fun. So if you're not hitting it solid or straight, then based on the feedback, like maybe I'm, I'm hitting a big slice. Now, when I look at the video, I can relate the movements that I'm making to a slice. I always, uh, I, I kind of throw my hands up when someone just sends me a swing with no description of what's going on and just says, what do you think? There's, there's just like too many variables there. So if you know what the problem is, then you can look at your video and you can identify what you need to do. But once you've identified what you need to do, then you have to be willing to experiment with different either feelings or drills or visuals or stations, whatever it is to help your brain figure out how to do it differently. And that's why there's so many videos because while there's a, a finite number of concepts, you know, like you only need to know that if it's slicing, your, your path is probably outside in and your club face is open, right? There's like, you gotta be able to recognize it on video, but there's only a couple concepts, but then the number of drills could be almost infinite. What, what relates to you might not relate to somebody who has a very similar ball flight just because you have a different anatomy and a different brain come into the equation. One of the drills I've already picked up on yeah. is I'm going to be stabbing the wall with, an, with a split hand grip. It, it's, it times everything up. It also, because in terms of you bringing up feel versus real mm -hmm. with Stan Utley, for example, yeah, apparently the lower body moves ahead a split second before the upper body. But maybe the feel is you're still kind of starting, the, 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 the difference is so infinitesimally small, you're almost feeling when you do that stab the wall, that's, that's kind of the, the, the feeling I want in terms of the difference between the upper body and the lower body firing. Totally, yeah. Some people do have to feel it much more exaggerated, but I think a lot of people feel it um, as working as one unit. Um, a, a classic example is uh, like pushing a shopping cart where you push with your legs and your core and your arms and your shoulders all together. If you just pushed with one area, like the shopping cart wouldn't move, right? But you would want to push with your legs slightly before you would push with your arms for maximum efficiency. Same thing here with the golf swing. We, when the lower body leads, it, it leads by you know the, the X factor stretch, the increase in your lower body stretch compared to your upper body 
it only increases by about eight degrees. Now to put that in perspective, if you imagine the clock, one minute on the clock would be six degrees. So if you're looking at someone from down the line, you need to be able to see their pelvis move about a minute and a half on on the clock face more than their upper body. It, like you said, it's it's very small, but it, it could be very significant. Now your Golf Smart Academy videos, I'm gonna point this out too. You got this whole, you know, your setup, your posture, et cetera. And this is, you know, I went through it, one of these, one of the videos, and it was like relaxed quads. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, because they always say you want to feel dynamic or active, kind of are a little bit tense there. And you start to get in that bent need, short stoppy type position. Cause that was also one of these keys people would put out back and they feel like you're a short stop, feel like you move even direction, but I don't know. The, the athletic posture, um, I, I remember, you know, feel like you're going to return a serve in tennis. A lot of these sports are toe dominant and a lot of these sports are quad dominant. And for the, the problem with that is it typically leads to the, um, the core being too stiff and not being able to move. And then you end up relying more on an upper body pull because the upper body pull um, tends to align with like bracing in the knees where if you're using a little bit more glute and hip action, it tends to support using more your obliques and some of your rotational muscles. So yeah, I think that, um, you know, that's where, okay, if you figured out like, Hey, maybe I'm, I'm getting steep and I need to get a little bit shallow and that would help me with, um, my consistency of contact as well as club face control. Well, if you start with a hierarchy and you look at yourself at setup, maybe you'll say, okay, I'm not even going to worry about the swing. I'm set up so much in my quads and my toes that I'm probably going to swing more up and down. Um, so that just gets you back into that, having a, a way to look through it so you can figure out what you need to do. And yeah, a lot of people are, are quad dominant and need to be a little bit more hip dominant for their, to, to do their kind of optimal swing. Now we're going to go full circle back to that champions tour video. And this is, this is very clever on my part. We've got Tom Lehman and we've got Bernard Langer in there and for me, you know, not having the knowledge that you do, it seems like these guys as their champion sword players, as they're, you know, over 50, their swings are something more duplicatable by the normal population than having a guy like DJ who's, who could dunk a basketball, super lean, you know, but you, you know, as we've said off, off the camera, that potentially it's just the optics that, you know, the other person, it's just how people's bodies line up differently. Yeah, I, I'd kind of explain it this way. Like, if you look at um, a golf swing, you could look at kind of the angle of the shaft, you could look at the angle of the arms, you could look at the position that they're in, and you could try to duplicate that. Or if you if you kind of understood how the pieces are fitting together, when they get into that position, they're creating tension or, or activity through a certain part of their body. So I, I do a presentation to coaches where I talk about trying not to be fooled by some of these things. Um, and I use a slide where um, I have a picture from a stretching class where basically you have these coaches who study anatomy, know the where they're supposed to feel this stretch. And it's a wide shot of all these different people performing the same stretch. And you've got, you know, some people, their arms are 20 degrees up. Some people it's in line with the shoulder. Like they've made all these individual little adjustments in order to feel the stretch the same way. So what I think can be challenging if you're if you're not used to looking at it this way is um how do you determine if the difference you see between dustin johnson and bernhard longer is they're really doing something different or they're doing the same thing but because they look you know their physiology is different it looks different enough and i would argue that for the most part they're doing closer to the same thing than they're doing different things and it just looks different because of their own individual anatomy you got Tom Lehman, you got Bernard Langer, and they don't, you know, obviously they've been playing into their 50s. Bernard Langer still winning US so senior US Open 65. This is insane. Amazing. How do you think in some level, maybe people would want to focus on building? Yes, they have a different type of um, physicality than other people, but maybe our bodies are more similar toward their physicality, not just in terms of look, but in terms of their methodology, like potentially shallowing the club out as you point in the video via your knees or your pelvis versus like the Will Zalatoris type style, which, you know, you hit 25 and then I'll see you in this spinal surgery center. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's where it goes back to that um, original idea. Like if you're going to be a good driver of the golf ball, 
you need to create a flattish bottom of the swing where the club face and path aren't changing that dramatically. In order to do that, you have to have more of the engine being your body and you need to have your arms kind of lengthening through there. It's really hard to have your arms fully straight and kind of swinging in more of like a V shape and not have the club face go from wide open to wide shut, which requires a lot more timing. Now, uh, like you mentioned, Bernhard Langer and um, uh, Tom Lehman do it more from their pelvis and their legs, where someone like Will Zalatoris gets a lot of the side bend from the spine. And if you're going to do it from the spine, you want to distribute it over the whole spine, where Will Zalatoris appears to do it like more from just like a small section of the spine, which is part of why I tend to believe that he got hurt faster than, say, like Amito Pereira um, or... Uh, Joaquin Neiman, um, who have similar, like, you know, lots of this crunch factor, uh, but a little different spine shape when they do it. So the, the important lesson there is to understand, okay, we need to get the club to do this kind of flat bottom of swing. What are our options, uh, both from the either the arms or the body? And Tom Lehman and Bernard Longer show maybe some easier ways to do it if you're limited in some spine flexibility. So they might be a better model, uh, like you said, rather than trying to kind of kill yourself trying to recreate a Will Zalatoris look. Well, then you also bring up that, you know, the, with Rocco Mediate, he uses, I guess, the ulnar... Ulnar deviation. There you go. So, so maybe you can combine them as well. So there's one option, there's two options, and then the option number three is a little bit of both. Yeah, so I like to teach um, a different, different levels of detail on the site. You know, if you're a new golfer, you can use really general concepts, but if you've been doing this for 20, 30 years, you might need to dig into some of the details. Well, there are, there are different body movements and there are different arm movements that make the club swing flatter or, or wider or shallower. Um, and you have, you have options. So Rocco Mediate, if his upper body is more on top, he's going to tend to be a little bit steeper just with his body. So he tends to have a look of a little bit more um, early unhinging. Now, part of the reason I put that in the video was um, back, you know, I think I did the video six or seven years ago. Um, and at the time, there was, we were kind of using 3D data to show that like trying to down cock kind of like a Charles Howell um, is potentially, uh, uh, A, it might not give you that much more speed and B, it creates a lot more club face timing. So I was showing Rocco um, doing this unhinged, but still hits the ball far enough to compete. Um, to show that you don't want to be afraid of the unhinge. In fact, the unhinge is not really what a casting movement was. So this was where I was trying to show how the 3D data was helping us maybe dissuade or disprove some of the um, kind of like golf uh, absolutes, you know, that you got to keep this angle in order to create lag. Um, no, Rocco's showing you what that, like how you really create lag. It, it has very little to do with the amount of unhinge. And if you're, if you're going to have a steeper body, you better have some shallower arms and your options there are more rotation or unhinge. And Rocco does it great with the unhinge. In terms of Charles Howell's down cocking. Yes. Is the trend nowadays almost the, the, the bowed that that's which so, so the kind of the rock. So you're already kind of shallow. You don't have to, you can focus more on the body rotation because you're already set in that position. Correct. Correct. That's definitely the more current trend, but Again, I think you have to be able to look at yourself to decide um, how much of that you personally need. So if, if I was trying to decide if I needed more of this, right, I would kind of look at, well, well, what does this do? This allows me to create some shaft lean. Um, this allows me to deal off the club. This allows me to um, uh, uh, create more body rotation and more side bend. Um, so if I'm struggling with the club face being open, because I'm hitting a slice, this might be good. If I'm struggling with more of a scoop down at the bottom, um, this might be good. Uh, but I need to have some of those other pieces in place. I've seen some people who have kind of a, you know, a scoop release down at the bottom, and then they start trying to do the, I call it the motorcycle, but they start trying to bow the wrist, and then they start hitting pull hooks um, because they applied the the right move at the wrong time. Like you have to have a couple other moves lined up before you should really put that one in place. You know what the move is? You need the body rotation. I watched the video. Yes, that's right. Golf YouTubers are very popular nowadays. Mm -hmm. And some of their numbers are, you know, competing with 
PGA Tour events in terms of the views? Because, you know, if you're having a kind of a, a lower tier event, maybe maybe more people are actually watching these YouTube videos. Do you ever think of like reaching out to, say, for example, Rick Shields and sending him a couple of your videos? Because you built a relationship online with um, Charles Howell III, not even trying to. But now you know that there's a potential there to build that bridge. And this guy, I made a video maybe two years ago or so, a year and a half, where I clearly point out that he has ruined a million golf swings. And people, like 75% negative reviews. I was waking up every day for six months having to defend myself. And you know why? It's because guys got super weak grip. Guy was teaching people to set the wrist right off the bat. And now he's got this super like cupped look already halfway back. I guess that's like P2 or P3. And now he has to flip the club every time. And he's actually instructing, and if you look at the video, he's instructed a million people. So anyone who's watched that, it's basically like the movie The Ring, except for instead of having a person crawl out of your TV, your golf swing's ruined. I'm happy to talk with um, anybody. Um, I would say as my current role, um, I'm pretty active teaching. You know, I probably teach somewhere 35 to 40 hours of actual lesson time each week. So I, if I could go back to when I was in Denver and I had more time, if if this you know network of online golf instructors and things like that was around, I probably would have been a lot more active than I am right now. But I'm I'm I love talking about the golf swing with uh, what I call golf nerds. So I'd be happy to talk with uh, with Rick or or any of the other uh, big names out there. There's definitely ones in there. His shoulder alignment maybe, but you have that great one, the video where you show um, if you if you keep your you know your a closed shoulder stance it helps kind of shallow it. You know, if you have the, yeah, and then I'm like, it makes sense. Why, but why isn't almost if everyone, cause everyone does this little move when they grab the club and they're over the top, everyone's ending up here halfway down the downswing. No one's in that, that good position. It feels like you could set, set, you could tweak the address a little bit. So people are already cheating a little bit with that shallow and just make that the industry standard. Because after three years, the statistics show you don't get better at golf. I agree. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to, uh, at least have my students buck that trend you know i've i have a lot of my in-person students who continue to get better even if they're you know 75 like i've i've got one golfer in his uh, late 70s who's hitting the ball as far and and as good as he's ever done and i take a lot of pride in the work he's done over the last four or five years but as far as rick specifics i you know maybe he would be a fun collab and, and case study where you know we could he, he could be his own coach. Maybe I could point him in a few directions, but see what he could get out of out of working at some of the drills. I'm sure we could get him better than bogey golf if that's what he's shooting. If you watch his last video where he plays the Ryder Cup course, he's. I mean, granted, it's hard, but you're you're watching. You're like, it. Sometimes you're like, it's not that hard to hit a 90 yard shot from the fairway. There's certain stops where it's like, I mean, you can. So you don't have to. My, here's my here's my take on that. Every like I um. As a, as a golf instructor, I work with a lot of different types of golfers, right? And everybody thinks the stroke, the, the shot, the, the only one that seems to be um, like socially acceptable is if you have trouble with accuracy off the tee with the driver, because it's like, it's the driver, you're swinging it hard. But, you know, if, whether you have chip yip issues, whether you have contact issues with your short irons, there are certain movement patterns that make you predisposed to that. So like I've got I've got some single digit golfers who chunk I'd say, you know, at least when they start with me, they chunk like 80% of their wedges or they blade them um because they have a hard time shifting their technique from the driver swing to a wedge swing. And and that's where like having some of this knowledge and maybe some of these options like maybe he fits in that category. Maybe he's a decent driver of the golf ball, but he doesn't know how to adapt it to that 90 yard shot at this point i'm afraid rick shields is good at no shots okay pretty much dead straight birdie pot but in terms of what you brought up there i like how you're very much like the old school lineup for the driver it's off like your left side you get you got you got i feel like for a while they're trying to teach against having that that kind of tilted address you have the jackson five we were talking talking off air about how like golf instruction tends to cycle, right? Like you, uh, we were talking about this video and shallowing and how people didn't used to talk about shallowing. But 
they they used words that described it so they would talk about the club falling in the slot or they would talk about kind of sweeping the club down to bottom versus like uh you know it was always sweep the woods and driver and strike down with the irons right that could be interpreted as you need to have more upper body on top of the iron and a little bit more of the upper body behind now we know from 3d or at least i know from 3d that uh, typically tour pros are going to be about 20 degrees tilted behind the ball with the driver at impact and about four or five degrees tilted behind with an iron. Now there's ways to adjust that with your setup and your pelvis and, and stuff like that. But that by itself could be enough of the difference in shallow and sweep it versus cover the ball and, and strike down on it. Well, I like in your, one of your videos, how you show the setup, you know, you've got the alignment stick, you, mm -hmm. you, you put on the little thing, but you don't need to take it off because it's, it's windy or what have you, windy, but, yeah. but you got the head here for the driver, but now for the irons, now the ball is off your, more of your face versus yeah. behind. It. And that, does that, does that simple enough switch for the, your, for your uh, pupils who are good with the driver? If you just have them kind of get their nose more over it, does that now they get crisper with the irons or um, is it more, more deeper than that? One of the beautiful things about golf and why, you know, there's, there are very few sports where coaches like myself can make a good living um, because there's layers to golf for a lot of people. That's going to be enough. But if you happen to be the, the one person where that's not enough. And when you get there, your brain just keeps wanting to tilt behind, like maybe you set up fine. And when you're set up fine, your arms don't work very well anymore. Or you, you, you like gravitate towards moving backward during the swing. Um, if that's you, then you have to be able to explore other options to s get there and stay there. So um, that's where I think, you know, a, a lot of the kind of classic golfers would describe the all the swings are the same. It's just setup changes. But then if you if you listen to them, they would say, oh, well, you know, with the driver, you go a little bit more with your hips and you're a little bit more tilted behind and you listen to them and they describe similar to what we were talking about earlier they describe maybe three to five little adjustments for each of their shots. And that was their recipe. Like that's how they, they had success with each club was just memorizing these little threat three to five keys. If you don't automatically make some of those changes, then you can get stuck where you just don't know how to hit one shot. And so part of golf Samaritan Academy is helping, I hope helping you understand how to adjust for each club and um, you mentioned the alignment six. Some people are very visual and they love that. Some people aren't very visual. They're more feel or they're more into rhythm. And that visual by itself doesn't do a whole lot. They need more a feel of what it's like to be a, on top of it or behind it. And that's where things like the Jackson five um, or some of the core things might uh, resonate with those golfers a little bit better. Can you talk them through the Jackson five just a little bit? Yeah. So the, the Jackson five is, um, I had a, I did, um, one of the early things that we saw with 3d was that, uh, like 95% of golfer of tour golfers with their driver will have a lateral bump of the lower body before it rotates. Um, it's small, but the order of bump then rotate is pretty important. And that helps to create that 20 degree tilt, um, behind the golf ball, which helps shallow things, get the club swinging more from the inside. Um, even if you're hitting a fade like more from the inside relative to the body shallower slower club face uh, rotation like lots of good things that help with consistency um and i i would teach it as kind of this little hip bump and i had a dance instructor who said it was like the kind of one of the backup dancers of the jackson or of the jackson five um it was like one of the background motown dance moves that they would do so we started calling it the jackson five um and you know with my fitness background i noticed that Students seem to like when you had an, a fun name for an exercise rather than like, hey, we're going to do a glute hip extension. We're going to do bridges, right? Like, so having having like some fun names for these key movements gave us a good language. And, and Jackson 5 was one of the ones that kind of stuck for initiating with your lower body with a little bit of a bump before you rotate. I think everyone finds the Jackson 5, you know, humorous and fun, except for the actual Jackson 5. Probably, <laughs> but we're not, we're not going to get into Probably. childhood trauma stories. Um, Correct. Yeah, let's keep <laughs> on track. And and yeah. so the Jackson Five is an interesting one too because um, oftentimes I'll have the if, if you think about some of the stereotypical golfers that we get, like the golfer who slices off the tee 
they almost always need to work on the Jackson five, but some of the golfers who are really good drivers of golf ball and struggle with their short irons, they probably are already doing it automatically. So I'll have some golfers join the site and post their swing and basically say like, Hey, I, I, I don't feel like I'm doing the Jackson five correctly. And I'll be like, dude, you're doing more than enough of the Jackson five. So like, even with, um, even when you're trying, like when you're early on and you're trying to figure out how to be your own coach, it's easy to gravitate towards something that you might already be doing. Similar to like some people feel like they really have to bow the wrist like a John Rahm, but the tour average for the amount of bow is only about 20 to 30 degrees. You might be doing it and not even realizing that you're doing it. And, and that's just one of the fun challenges of, of golf is figuring out what you need to work on. What's also awesome about Golf Smart Academy Online, as you, as you said before, it's, it's also for the golf nerd. It's so nitty gritty detailed where I'm watching Greg Norman's hands at address at impact and they're different. Yes. So you got that. So you, I mean, if you, if you really want to go down that rabbit hole, which I love, I do all the time. That's how I found your video. Yeah. Um, also with the right thumb, how it's kind of offset where a lot of people put it down the middle or, you know, they have it kind of pinched. Doesn't that almost encourage you to, cause you have that, that power source there when your when your thumb is connected to your, your right index finger versus when it's offset, you know, I mean like just these little minor details could make the difference yeah. in terms of, of everything. Yeah. When, you know, going back to where we were talking about uh, tension versus look, when you when you squeeze more the index finger in your thumb like that, you tend to activate muscles more along the top side of the arm and into the shoulder. And that's going to encourage it going more like this, where if you grip more with the middle fingers or even the, the kind of the uh, pinky side of the arm, that's going to go more um, into the inside of the armpit. And that's going to encourage uh, a little bit better shallowing or what I call the white movement from that right arm, like getting the arms more in front of your body. So yeah, some of the, that's one of my favorite things about golf is that, you, you know, it's almost like learning, uh, like dance. Like if you just want to learn how to dance at a wedding, you, you just need to learn the steps, right. And hope that your partner knows. But if you wanted to be elite level, you have to know how to like lead the movement from the proper part of your body. Same thing with the club. Like if you, if you just want to break 90, then you just kind of have to learn how to um, control contact and, and reasonable direction and, and not play stupid and, and keep the, the quads and, and triples out off the card. But if you want to compete at a really high level, it could be something like you said about like this little detail of where your thumb is that unlocks a whole different pathway of, of movement for you that'll have a big impact on your, your performance. Well, it's interesting because you have Jason Kokrak. He has it off before he takes the club away. I know you used Brant Snedeker as an example. Yeah. Um, if you look at Rory, he has it connected. And then right before he takes it away, he moves it to the side. Correct. And then you also have um, Xander Shoffley has That's his whole little weird waggle is his, you know, fidgeting with his right thumb the whole time. And then he takes it away. Yeah. Yeah. I've, and I have, I have that drill of the Hogan where you hit it without your thumb. I had a student this uh uh, a few days ago on Thursday, where it was like a revolution, um, you know, having them hit some shots without the thumb, like seemed to really help improve transition um, and the and the release. So sometimes you have to go directly at like, you know, okay, here's what we want to do during the transition and the release. But sometimes a little setup change can like uh, open up the floodgates of performance. Well, it's weird. Is it to me? It seems like back in the day. It was always like short thumb. You'd want like a short, like left thumb. And now you see like Dustin Johnson and Kyle Marikawa, you can actually see their thumb sticking out, you know, through their grip a little bit. So what is your preference in terms of the length of the thumb? Um, that's a, that's a great question. Here's what I, so I personally play with a little bit more of a short thumb. I grew up kind of, you know, I, I took lessons 20, almost 30 years ago now at this point. Um, I think that when you have a shorter thumb, you have more of a lever of being able to push with that thumb. When you have a longer thumb, you have more range of motion. Um, so depending on your, like how you're loading the shaft, if you're loading it kind of quicker with um, kind of more of an explosive arm action, you probably would gravitate more towards a short thumb. Um, if you're doing a little bit more like slow, gradual build, then you might get away with the longer thumb. It's almost like having a, let's say a perfect way to hold a pencil. I, I think if you were to 
study artists, they all hold the pencil slightly differently. Um, as long as you have control of the implement. So when I'm looking at the grip, I'm making sure that the wrists have enough range of motion and you have control of where the club face is pointing. As long as you have those two kind of prerequisites, then I think it's okay to explore different options. And so if maybe I looked, if we looked at video and maybe we need, we wanted to get more of an angle, then maybe we go long thumb. But if the wrists were looking like they're working fine, there might be something else that jumps out as a higher priority. In terms of your background in biomechanics, that's, you're able to tie all that in there to help optimize the lesson. That's my goal, yes, is to s streamline that process um, and help pick which of the four or five things. Oftentimes I will tell students like, okay, here's what's going on. We could either fix this by changing the arms this way, or we could fix this by changing the body this way. And I often ask, which do you think would be more fun or which do you think you'd be more comfortable with? Now, oftentimes I'll say, if you're not sure, let's just try both for 10 minutes and see which one you like. And then we'll go after that one. In terms of change in the body, are you saying, Hey, I need you to, to, to start doing planks. You need some more core strength. What, what exactly are you doing to get this person up so that they can have an optimal golf swing for their, for themselves? If they're like a, a more serious golfer, then yeah, I'll talk to them about things that they could do in their exercise program to help. Um, but for most golfers who are just looking to perform a little bit better, um, oftentimes I'll do like a little activation exercise or awareness exercise. Um, so whether it's using a band or a ball or um, something up against the wall, um, like uh, you mentioned that kind of stab the wall drill, right? Like that's kind of activating some muscles so that then when you, when you make your swing, you're going to be more likely to use a, a different pathway than you're used to. Um, so my goal is to, to try to like activate what I want to use so that then you can figure out how to coordinate it in a, in an actual golf swing. Have you watched the workout videos of Bryson DeChambeau when he was working with that certain expert and they're doing all the uh, machines and he's activating certain specific uh -huh. and yeah, then uh, Greg, Greg Roscoff, when I lived in Colorado, I actually, um, Greg Roscoff came and took one of my clinics and I actually gave him like two or three uh, like individual lessons. Um, we didn't over, um, I've had some injuries, so I was picking his brain as far as what he thought might've been going on with my neck and shoulder. And I was helping him work on closing the club face. Ironically. It's amazing like, because he's, yeah, it, it, it's like 60 exercises. It seems like Bryson's doing every inch of every type of thing on a machine. When you're, when you go to, to working a muscle, like let's say I wanted to work my bicep, I, you can work over like the whole range of the muscle. Or you could do like just at the very end or just at the very end. Like there are different ranges that you could do. Um, so one of the ways to build safety into your swing is to establish strength in the longer position and the shorter position rather than in the, the medium. And so what Bryson did a lot of was that longer end range of motion strength training. Um, and especially if you're trying to like lengthen your swing and feel your, have your brain feel safe with a longer swing or a more explosive swing when you're stretched. Uh, that's a, that's a great approach. Well, Bryson to me is, and I guess also maybe even Matt Fitzpatrick because Matt Fitzpatrick after Bryson won the U S open said he wasn't that impressed with just hitting it far, but then immediately gets the whole system together so he can crush it and hit it far, which is odd to yeah. me. So he literally bad mouthed it and then goes right into Bryson's program, not in terms of the bulk, but in terms of the speed training. Now he's crushing the ball. He wins, then he wins the U S open. Yeah. Um, but then you had Bryson, he had about. I don't know, a good year where he, I guess he was trying to lose the weight or maybe he was injured. Mm -hmm. And so, but now he's back. He's won two of the, his last three live events and, but he's a leaner guy now. He's he, did you prefer Hulk Bryson or did you, or that more like the le leaned out Ryan Gosling version now? <laughs> um, so as like, you know, I'm not, I'm not really a researcher. I'm more of a practical application guy, but, um, from a perspective, I would have loved to have seen him do one or the other first. So he kind of made swing changes and bulked up simultaneously, or at least that's how it, it, it saw, uh, seemed to us. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical as far as how much the distance came from bulking up versus the swing changing. I would have loved to have seen if he had just done um, the, the lengthening the swing and like the long drive training without, you know, putting on however much weight he put on. Um, cause I don't think that now that he's lost the weight, I don't think that he's lost any distance. 
Um, so my preference would be a little bit more of the Ryan Gosling rather than the Hulk version. I was joking about that, but you, if you, if you want to say Ryan Gosling, okay. But yeah, this is, this has been awesome. Um, I appreciate your time. Look forward to having you on again. Um, I'm going to have, you know, obviously everyone at home check out golf smart Academy. It's awesome. I accept it as a challenge that I only have maybe three days now to go through a thousand videos. I'm getting to it. And as you can see, I'm just, I'm just storing it in there. All the, whatever is it, you know, thumbs, you know, and it's awesome because, you know, as you kind of point out, it's, you may have a concept wrong of what you're trying to do and actually be trying to do something like have your hands that address and impact the same, which isn't, which is the wrong objective. Yeah. So I like how you spell it out. You, you could be potentially saving people years of frustration. That's my goal. I, um, you know, I always looked at it as like, if you're as a golfer, um, I never really wanted to cater the people who just wanted a, a quick five minute tip. But if you're willing to kind of work at it and you're trying to get better and you're not getting better, like you're you're the people who I, I sympathize with. Like I want to make sure that if you're putting in a lot of work, you do it as efficiently as possible. So you you keep getting better and enjoying this game. Folks, subscribe, share, and like. That was awesome.